you guys graduated from primary school? Sorry. Who didn't graduate from primary school here? Everybody graduated from primary school. Maybe you should take yourself back to primary school now, right? When I was in primary school, I went to a cool primary school. I went to three primary schools, but the last one was very cool. The other two, I'm not going to talk about them. When I was in primary school, they used to bring motivational speakers to our classrooms. And they used to say many things. But one of the things that they always, the major refrain was always that, children, you are the leaders of tomorrow. Children, I'm sure you can remember, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I was one of those people that believed those guys. So in believing them, I was really committed to being that leader of tomorrow. So even at that level, at that age, I used to read, even though, even if I say so myself, I used to top the class every term. My uniform was always clean. I used to have a haircut every week. The other, the other students used to be people at that time. They used to look out for my haircut. I was so committed to being this leader of tomorrow. I was very, very interested in citizenship education. If you remember citizenship education, that was our government at that level. If you were interested in politics, governance, that was our government at that level. I also paid attention to the news. I used to actually read the newspapers. But really, I was more interested in the sport news. I followed the Super Eagles in Tunisia, Tunisia 94. I followed the Super Eagles, USA 94. I followed Stephen Keshi and his career in Belgium, Daniel Amokachi, and all these other superstars we had at that time. So I believed it. Children, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I believed it. I lived it. One of these days in primary school, I was just with one of my friends, and he was like, we were reading a history textbook, and there was this picture of King's College Lagos there. I had never known anything about King's College Lagos. And the boy told me, Lekon, he told me that his brother was in King's College. <laughs> so I was like, what's wrong with this one? Kilo Shele is, is He's, he's lying to me. So I was like, that's the school I'm going to. That was my first time of knowing whether there was anything called King's College. But I, it was part of the history of Nigeria, so I felt that it was an interesting school. So I chose King's College. Cut the long story short, I got into King's College. At King's College, they didn't tell us, children, you are the leaders of tomorrow, because we were not children. But they made it clear to us that we were being prepared for leadership. So at that level, even though we were not told that we were the leader, leaders of tomorrow, it was pretty clear that whatever that tomorrow was, whether for primary school or secondary school, that tomorrow had not come because we were still being prepared for that tomorrow. University, I was sitting in the school auditorium, my 100 level, and there was this student agitation that was going on. And one of the student leaders in his final year, and everybody in university, of course, is a bona fide adult. One of the student leaders came. Greatest Nigerian students, they shouted, great. Greatest Nigerian students, the others shouted, great. We, the youth, are the leaders of tomorrow. We are the leaders of tomorrow. I was quiet. And I was like, what's going on here? When I was in primary school, They told me, children are the leaders of tomorrow. And here I was, a bona fide adult at the university, and fellow young people were telling themselves that they were the leaders of tomorrow. I started to do the mathematics. One of the equations was definitely wrong. And it was very, very easy to know the one that was wrong. Children are leaders of tomorrow, I believe. Youth leaders of tomorrow, I don't. Even those that taught us that children, you are the leaders of tomorrow in primary school, they had it somewhere at their subconscious that the leadership they were referring to was political leadership, political positions, governor, commissioner, minister, senator, president, you know the rest of them, SSA, SA, and the other ones they've created. We cannot afford to be limited by those limiting definitions of leadership. 
My friend Simi Fajr Mirokun was here. She's working in education. She didn't have enough time to actually say all the great things she's doing. Herself and I, the other young people she leads are all under 30. Will anyone deny that she is a leader today? Nasir, your mama that just finished speaking, is working in agriculture. His work has been profiled by global organizations. Powerful foreign governments are paying attention. Some of the world's richest men are happy to take pictures with him. Is Nasir a leader today or tomorrow? He's a leader already. I know a young Nigerian in here, Aboyeji. He's founded two big companies. He's just about 26 or 27. And the companies he's founded have gone on to raise about $40 million. Don't get it twisted. The tomorrow they told us about when we were in primary school, we are already living in that tomorrow because that tomorrow will never come. We are not the leaders of tomorrow. The leaders of tomorrow are the children. I can't see them here. I'll tell you a story. So I come from Ondo State. There's this part in Ondo State called Ugbonla. It's not such a popular place, Ugbonla. It was founded by this man. He was also a prophet. He was their leader. His name was Ogufe Itimi, Elisha. They popularly called him Lene, Elisha Lene. And he used to dream. He used to tell the people. It was a thick village, you know, forest, everything, wilderness. I'm talking about 1948, 1950. And he used to come in the morning during their prayer sessions, and he would say, Ojoka, Onara la Nigbunla. Ojoka, Onara la Nigbunla. That is to say, one day there would be a road in Nigbunla. One day there would be a road in Nigbunla. The people were very, very happy to hear this vision of this man that one day there was going to be a road in Nigbunla. And he came every year, several times during the year, every year. Morira, I saw a vision. Ojoka, Onara la Nibunla. But you know, he was always coming, they, was, they were always hearing. There was no road in Ugbonla. One morning he came as usual and he told them, true story. And he told them, today, Eni, Onara la Nibunla. That means today, there will be a road in Ugbonla. And he carried his cutlass. And the other things. <laughs> and he entered the forest. <laughs> of course, the people followed him. That day, the road they spoke of about tomorrow became a real road. They created it. I told that story because when we have dreams and visions, we make two big mistakes. We always think that it's in the future. A place that is so far away that really maybe you shouldn't bother to get to yet. And two, which is as important, we always think that there are some other people that will come make those dreams come true. Both are wrong. The reason is because tomorrow will never come. Our own tomorrow, we are already living in it today. So whatever plans, vision, dreams we have, we are better get started with them now. Because the leaders they spoke about when we were in primary school, we are here already. If this were a presentation, if this were a music performance, it would be a medley where, say, you have five hits and you don't have time. So you had to wrap up all the different songs together in that medley. So I speak about culture. We used to kill twins. It was right, it was cultural, it was normal. We don't kill twins anymore. The definition of culture that I'm used to, that I'm sure a lot of people are used to, is that culture is a way of life of a people way of life, their ideas, their practices of a people. I believe that any definition of culture 
that does not factor in time is incomplete. So, I choose to redefine culture as a way of life, ideas, and practices of a people at a particular point in time. Which means that the fact that we used to do it in the past does not mean we have to do it today or we have to continue to do it tomorrow, especially if it does not work for us. President Barack Obama said to an audience just like this, he said that the fact that something used to be a part of our past and it doesn't work for us does not mean that it has to define our future. Our culture is very beautiful. I mean, look at me. In different ways, our culture is very, very beautiful. Look at all the design. The way we, we don't pay attention to our culture when we even build our houses anymore. We are losing some of our culture. There's a lot of things that are very beautiful about our culture. Look at, look at respect, for instance. But we also know that there are certain parts of our culture that we have to do away with. We need to think about those things and stop saying, this is how we used to do them. We need to ask ourselves, is this right for us? If it is not, then it should not define our future. Too many times we pretend about it, but our society limits women. Our society makes it look like we are copying some foreign thing when we let women take their rightful position in society, which is the same position a, any human being can take in society, whether it's being the leader of the society, being the doctor, being anything. 5,100 or so years ago, about 3,100 years before the common era, in Egypt, the first nation state, Africa, women were leaders. Women were lawyers. Women were part of the jury. Anything you see today that some other societies are trying to do, calling women empowerment and gender equality, they took out of Egypt. So gender equality is not foreign to us. Gender equality began with us. It is normal, it is right. The world is going in the direction that Egypt was 5,000 years ago, actually more than 5,000 years ago, because that was 3,100 BC. We need to understand that one of the reasons why our society continues to be backward is because we continue to relegate half of the society. Football matches are played by 11, the normal football matches. 11 players per side. The average Nigerian society is half of 50% women, 50% men. Imagine you're playing a football match like Arsenal was beating Leicester City yesterday, and Arsene Wenger decided that half of his players should pause, because pause, let the other half play. There is no way, even if, there is no way you're going to play at your optimal when half of your team is not playing. In 1970, there was, a, there was a court of appeal ruling in the United States that helped to open up the space for women to participate in the US economy fully. That decision is the effect of one quarter of the American GDP today. That means the fact that they took that decision has, a, has so much effect on the US economy if you're going to quantify it in dollars, it's one quarter of today's GDP of US economy. Over the last one decade, it has been said and agreed in a World Economic Forum report that the reduction in the gap between female and male participation in Europe is one of the major reasons of development, economic growth in Europe. Let's come back to Nigeria. We talk about Nigerian superstars. Our stars, music stars, are superstars anywhere in Africa. Anywhere in Africa. Our movie stars are superstars anywhere in Africa. In terms of soft power, in this country right now, in this continent right now as I speak, there is no country that has Nigeria's soft power. 
And that soft power was not deployed by any Nigerian government or any Nigerian government policy. It was deployed by Nigerians, me, you, the Donjazis and the Dibanj, the Patience Oz Ozokwas, the Whiskies, the Davidos, all of those guys. But people forget that outside of that creative space of Nollywood and music, you cannot have a conversation of development in Africa, anywhere in the world, including in Africa, without seeing Nigerians. Intel when, when we have intellectual conversations on development, whether it's a conference, whether it's a workshop, whether it's a research on development in Africa, you will see Nigerians. You will, I guarantee you. Any conference in Africa that is talking about development, that there's no Nigerian, maybe they decided that that conference is for French Africa, but they will consult Nigerians. So it means that inherently, there is nothing wrong with the individual Nigerian. But then, how is it that we have one of the worst highest, one of the worst poorest human development index? How many of us watch Voltron? If you did not, you can still go and watch it on YouTube. Voltron, five powerful forces come together to form a super force. What we have not done in Nigeria is to form that super force. The coming together of different forces, the coming together of different tongues, the coming together of different people to make a society work. As soon as we do that, this country will work. Thank you. Okay, I'm not done. Is this cup half full or half empty? Is it half full or half empty? Whether you say this cup is half full or you said this cup is half empty, at least there's nobody that will say this cup is empty. Right? As far as I'm concerned, when we have a conversation on whether the cup is half full or half empty, for me, that conversation is as much a conversation on privilege as it is a conversation on optimism or pessimism. The time it took me to speak, two Nigerian women died because they were having children. She mentioned it. There are some 14 million Nigerian children that are out of school. For those ones, the cup is empty. And that is why we are here, to make sure that all of these people, at least their cups too, are half full, so that they can have that privileged argument about whether the cup is half full or half empty. Thank you. <laughs>